Hi, and welcome to Things in My Head. I'm Angel, your host. I am so glad that you decided to join us for this particular episode of Things in My Head because this is probably the most important interview I have ever done. This is an interview that you need to listen to and you need to call every woman that you know and tell her how to find this interview or sit in a room with a bunch of your girlfriends and listen together because this interview is going to change how you think about breast cancer. We've heard a lot about breast cancer with a lot of celebrities having double mastectomies. Christina Applegate, Angelina Jolie, Juliana Rancic, all of these women decided to have double mastectomy either after finding that they had the gene for breast cancer or finding that they had breast cancer. It seems to have gotten a lot of media attention. But at the same time, do those of us who have not gone through this, do we really get it? Do we really know what it's like for someone to go through a diagnosis of having breast cancer, to go through the double mastectomy, to go through the treatment, to go through all of those emotions and all of the things that go with it? And that is the reason for this show today. So I want to say right off the bat, if you do have small children in the room, if you are listening to this on an open computer or your iPad or iPhone, I do caution you that this show is going to get graphic. It may be a really good idea to either use headphones or maybe listen to it at another time when maybe you and your girlfriends are alone and there's no little ears around. We are going to talk candidly and openly with a young lady who has decided to come forward and talk about her experience from beginning to end in this two-part podcast. We'll be right back. For centuries, essential oils have been trusted to treat injuries, bring health and wellness, and peace of mind. Rocky Mountain Oils has that knowledge and experience and brings the purest essential oils to your family. Offset the high cost of medicine and rely on the experience, trust, and insight of the ancients and Rocky Mountain Oils. Call 1-866-493-8159 or visit us at www.rockymountainoils.com. Hi, everybody, and welcome back to Things in My Head. I am going to tell you that this show is going to be a very emotional show. It's going to be a very informative show because I'm going to introduce you today to a young lady who is in the same league as those women that I mentioned at the top of the show, and she's one of the bravest people that I know. Her name is Gwenda Kay. Hi, Gwenda. How are you doing? I'm doing good. How are you, Ange? I'm really good. Gwenda, I want to ask you, uh, for my listeners' sake, when were you diagnosed with breast cancer? I was actually diagnosed in May of last year. Um, On May 22nd, I went in for uh, cyst removal. And a week later, May 29th, went back to have stitches removed and discovered that it was not a cyst. It was actually a cancerous tumor. What went through your head, your thoughts at that moment when the doctor just, I mean, you're going in for this routine cyst removal. Right. Well, you know, I had had fibrous cysts all my adult life. And um, when we decided to have this one removed, honestly, it, it just never crossed my mind that it would be anything else. I, it just never did. And When I went in on May 29th to have my stitches removed and um, my surgeon told me that I had cancer, literally the floor just opened up. I I couldn't believe it. I, I was absolutely astounded. We were so unprepared for it, Ange, that my husband did not go to that appointment with me. He went to work that morning and I went to get my stitches out and he, he just, you know, said, call me when you're back home. And I, I ended up in the parking lot at where he works. And, and I said, you know, you need to come to the parking lot and we need to talk. And, and when he got to the parking lot, by the time he got there, he knew. I mean, he just knew. Were you wondering what you were going to say to him? Did you have a speech prepared? Oh, God, no. I I couldn't even, all the way there, it took me about 30 minutes to get there. And and all the way there, all I could think over and over in my head was, what am I going to do now? What am I going to do now? What am I going to, it's just, it was a, it was a, it was a mantra in my head. I couldn't even say the word cancer for days. I just couldn't say it. And I know you have children. And they're not young children. Your your children are older. 
Did you think about what you were going to say to them at that moment? Or was it just mostly about getting through this moment? It, it was just getting through. I, I, I had to tell my husband first, which I know sounds crazy because you would think that he would have been there or he would have had a clue. Or, But I mean, honestly, we didn't. Um, we were so unprepared that the very first thing that I had to do was I had to tell my own husband. And we had to have um, some grieving time together. What was that like when he reacted? Were you prepared for his reaction? <sighs> no, I, I wasn't really even prepared for my own reaction. But uh, he was just from from the very first moment when he walked into that parking lot and he saw the look on my face he just put his arms around me. He didn't say anything. He just put his arms around me. And we didn't talk for the longest time. We just stood right there in the middle of his parking lot at work and just held on. Um, there really wasn't for a long time anything to even say. But he has just been my strength. You know, through the whole thing, he has just been right there beside me. That's awesome. And I know... Because I know you personally, I know that you have this incredible support around you, and yeah. that's so important. I know one person that really had a hard time with this was your mom. What was it like telling her? It, it was hard to tell her, and the way that I told her was not the very best way either. Um, I, I I found out on the afternoon of the 29th that I had cancer, and, and as I said, went straight to my husband's place of work. And then we went home and both of my kids happened to be there. Um, my son had just come home from college um, and, and my daughter was out of school and they were both at my house, which is very unusual to have both of my kids at home at the same time, but they were. We sat down and we told them. Um, the, and it was the next day that I told my mom I had asked her if she would come by and visit with me. I had a doctor's appointment because Chris had not been there the day before when I got my diagnosis. And I couldn't remember anything that the doctor had said past the word cancer. Um, he had asked us to come back to his office that afternoon so he could sit down with me and my husband together. And I had asked my mom to come by before my doctor's appointment. And um, she was delayed g getting to my house. And so... I really kind of had to tell her and run, and I hated that. But I asked her if she would sit at my house and wait for me. And um, and when I came back home, she and I sat down and talked. And she was um, obviously shocked. Just overwhelming. It's just overwhelming. It, it, it's, it's an overwhelming thing to hear, whether it's you or someone that you know and love. Mm -hmm. Almost a, you go into shock. You do. Because you just... It's something that's so unbelievable. It is. It always happens to other people. Right. Until it happens to you. And suddenly, it's it's just suddenly your whole world becomes about cancer. I, I was just so unprepared for that. One minute I was living my life, and literally the next minute my whole life became cancer. What was your life like before? Tell us who Gwenda Kay was before this happened. Gwenda Kay was um, a wife, a mom to two fabulous kids and um, a teacher. I homeschool my daughter who is um, finishing up her senior year of high school and I also um, was a teacher of ho other homeschool high school students teaching um, English and history and world geography, and just, um, I was a busy girl. When you were diagnosed, obviously, you weren't able to continue working at a certain point. Did you try to continue for a little while and maybe think, I can muddle through this until I have to quit? Or did you just go ahead and quit right away, make that decision? Well, it was actually fortuitous, because I guess if you can say that anything about cancer is fortuitous, because I finished uh, my teaching for the year on May 17th, winning oh, okay. my biopsy on the 22nd. And so I would have had the summer off anyway. Um, but when August came, when I would normally have, have gone back to teaching, um, I, I was not able to. I was in the midst of chemo at the time. And for um, many, many reasons, most of them 
but not all of them physical. I just didn't feel up to teaching. And as a matter of fact, I didn't feel like I was equipped to even homeschool my daughter at that time. So she actually um, entered a an early enrollment program here at our local junior college. And she is this year spending this year getting dual credits for high school and college. Okay, well, that actually worked out. <laughs> it, it did. It, it worked out very well. But you know, I miss it. Mm -hmm. I really anticipated her senior year being one that we would go through much more together than we have. So everything was normal. And then all of a sudden, this diagnosis comes and your life changes. Now, other than school, and we know continuous doctor's appointments, because that's just part of the routine. You know, at some point, you're going to have to make a decision about what you're going to do about this. But how did your life change immediately? Um, immediately? Um, you know, I don't really know. I, I don't even really know how to answer that question. I mean, everything just changed. Um, you're right. There were so many doctor's appointments, um, literally beginning the very next day after my diagnosis. Um, between May 29th and June 6th, when I had my first surgery, um, you know, I had eight days to see several doctors to make some decisions and to, to decide what we were going to do. And, and somehow, somehow prepare for that. Um, and so, I, you know, everything about my life changed immediately just from what even I thought about every day. Your friends and family, other than your mother and your husband and your kids, they didn't know right away. You want to talk about that? Talk about what it was like? You know, and I have to let my listeners know at this point, too, if you haven't guessed already, Gwenda is a part of my extended family. We have been touched by breast cancer before in our family. So I just want to ask Gwenda what it was like having to bring that news up again, having to bring that subject up again in your family. You know, I have always been a very private person. I have always had, um, always maintained a certain distance with people. Um, th that's just the way I, I have always been. And I've not ever been one who has had a lot of friends at once, but have had a few friends that I've been very close to. And that's, that's the, the way that I am even now. Um, but I could not bring myself to tell them about my diagnosis. So I asked my mother if she would just, I made a list for her of about, I guess probably about five people um, that I wanted to tell and asked her if she would contact those people for me. Because at the moment I was too busy just concentrating on what I was going to do and getting that figured out. But I knew that there were some people that I really wanted them to know, and I wanted them not to hear it from anyone else other than someone that I knew and I trusted would handle the announcement with a lot of love and care. So you were thinking about everybody else even right from the beginning. You're a mom. You know what that's like. You think about it. When you're a mom, you think about everybody but yourself. Mm -hmm. You're last, you know. and. And so I, I was, I was thinking about other people. I was thinking about how were my kids really handling it? How was my mother really doing? Um, how were my friends going to handle this? Yeah, yeah I, I was, I was thinking about other people, but selfishly, I was thinking a lot about myself too. Yeah. You know, I, I completely understand the putting other people first. And I guess that a lot of people, when they hear about someone having breast cancer, who is, like you said, very private, who doesn't, you know, just go out and tell everybody that, hey, you know, this is a problem I have. I need help with it. I need your support. I need your help. You know, they're not soliciting funds for breast cancer awareness. You know, they're not, they're not giving out pink ribbons at every turn. You know, I think people think that, you know, wow, how selfish of that person. But really, from what I'm hearing in your voice, it's not, you're not even thinking that. You're not even aware, really, of what's going on around you other than this thing has dropped right. into your life. And, and when I say that your whole life becomes about that thing, I, I mean it seriously. Um, I have never had something that impacted me at that level before, you know, to the point that it's, it's, from the time you wake up until the time you go to bed at night, it, it's your world. 
but early. Well, you, you were very fairly healthy beforehand. You had normal allergies and, you know, IBS problems. You know, a lot of women have that kind of stuff going on in their lives. And so this was really the biggest illness. Am I right? Yes. You know, for years, I have been one of those people who have taken a lot of vitamins and supplements and I eat right and try to exercise when I'm not, you know, just running the kids around all over the place. But I tried to stay very healthy and very active and nobody really knows why people get cancer. But I, I don't think that I really actually did anything to bring it on. But, you know, who knows? I, I don't know how I got it. I don't know why I got it. One thing that I, I have tried very hard not to do during this whole process is succumb to the why me mentality. Um, cancer is no respecter of anyone. Gender, age, race. I mean, it, it really doesn't matter. Um, everybody is affected by it at one time or another, whether it's yourself or someone in your family. So I did try to keep myself very healthy and, and thought I was doing a good job, but it, it happened anyway. We're talking about breast cancer awareness today on Things in My Head. You can go to www.thingsinmyheadblog.com and you can get the synopsis of this show. We're going to give you a time code to tell you where certain topics about this subject are. And please, I want to remind my listeners that this is a very sensitive subject matter on today's show. If you have young children in the room, you may want to put on headphones or you may want to listen to the show at a later time when it's just you and maybe someone you love. And we'll be back right after this. Bridgeport Lake Bed and Breakfast outside Dallas. Texas can give you the perfect intermission of warmth and lake activities. From the long stem chocolate rose on your pillow at check-in to the made-to-order breakfast each morning, you'll leave your stress behind and immerse yourself in unparalleled Texas hospitality. Bridgeport Lake Bed and Breakfast. For reservations, call 940-644-0081 or visit us on the internet at www.bridgeportlake.com. BNB.com. Welcome back. We are talking with Gwenda Kay, who is a recent breast cancer survivor. We're calling you a survivor, even though it hasn't hit the five-year mark, you know, so you beat this thing. What does that feel like? <laughs> it feels great. Uh, I, I feel great, even though I just finished the actual treatment portion of my therapy or whatever you want to call it. Um, I'm starting to get my energy back and starting to get my hair back and get out more and it feels really good. I'm not exactly 100% certain that all of the cancer is gone. I have not had my first PET scan yet, but I'm living my life like I'm cancer free. So we're going to go back just a few minutes before the commercial break. We did talk about your initial diagnosis and what it was like moving through that with family and friends. I want to get to the portion where you had to make some really not only life altering, but physical altering decisions. You made the same decision that a lot of recent celebrities have made. Angelina Jolie, Juliana Rancic. You know, we've, we've heard about all these women making these radical decisions. What was, first of all, what was the decision and how radical was it for you to make that decision? Not all cancers are alike. You know that. Um, and, and even within that, not all breast cancers are alike. I have a friend who was diagnosed at the very same time I was with breast cancer. She and I, though, had two different kinds of breast cancer. Hers was a ductal cancer. Mine, on the other hand, was called lobular cancer, which basically means it's the kind of cancer that spreads through tissues rather than staying within a certain, for example, a certain duct. Um, and at the time, we knew after, after the biopsy that this particular cancer had already started spreading. It was contained to my left breast. However, the doctor told me that there was a 40 to 60% chance that because it was a lobular cancer and it was multifocal and it was spreading, that within five years, I would be back having a mastectomy on my right side as well. And I just... I could not see myself doing this again in five years. Yes, there was a 40 to 60% chance that, that that would never happen to me, but I actually have some friends and acquaintances 
who opted for single mastectomy who have had to go back and face it all over again years later, even uh, one lady 20 years later. And I just couldn't do that. I, I, I just couldn't see myself worrying about it. Even if I never had it happen, I know myself well enough to know I would have constantly worried, is it going to happen? And so I'm, my husband and I made the decision based on my, not just my current health, but my future health as well. We opted for the double mastectomy. When you made that decision, was it something that you had to get used to, the idea of that? Oh, oh yes. Um, it, I have always been able to laugh at myself for how completely flat-chested I am. I mean, I, I've just always, with very self-deprecating humor, have always said I have the body of a 12-year-old boy. But it's just, it's not so much <laughs> that as it's just, it's a part of who you are. Um, you know, if I had had cancer in my foot and had to take my foot off, I mean, it, it wouldn't have really, I don't think, mattered the body part itself so much as the fact that we were saying, you know, do you have to prepare yourself for that? And And yes, you do. I mean, but you have to prepare yourself for any kind of surgery and you have to prepare yourself anytime that, that there's any part of your body that you know that you're going to go in and it's there and you're going to come out and it's not. Was it still a shock for you after the surgery? Everything is said and done. Did your emotions kind of change at that point? Yes, they did. Uh, it was, I had to grieve that. There are so many things about this that I have had to go through a grief process over. And that's one of them. I know that we're getting into some territory that people don't talk about when they have breast cancer. These are some things that most people who have breast cancer don't talk openly about. And we're talking about the emotions and we're talking about your raw emotions. Did other people react to your raw emotions? Did they treat you different? No, I don't think so. A lot of people uh, felt those emotions along with me. That's what's so nice about having the support that I did. I had people who would come over who would just sit and just cry with me. Um, they asked me if I wanted to talk, and if I wanted to talk, they would listen. And if I didn't, they wouldn't. I could be sitting in the middle of a, a restaurant having a conversation with a friend and burst into tears, and, and they weren't embarrassed by that. They they never asked me, you know, not not to show emotion or to get it under control, they just handed me Kleenex. <laughs> <laughs> Coffee and a Kleenex works every time. <laughs> you talk about going out in public. Was that hard for you after the double mastectomy? Well, for the first 10 days after double mastectomy, I didn't go out very much, but that was because I had four drain bags, of course. Um, and it was awkward. It, it was very difficult to find clothing. I had to wear extremely oversized clothing. I had to wear my, my husband's extra large t-shirts and, and it was, I, I didn't feel well. I didn't feel like I, I looked very good and I didn't move around extremely well. And so for the first 10 days until I got my drain bags out, I mostly just stayed at home and, um, and just convalesced. But after my drain bags were out and I started feeling a little better, yeah, I started going out more. You know, I wanted as much as possible. I wanted a normal life. I, I did not want to be forever completely consumed by what was going on with me physically. That's fair. I'm going to uh, ask you a very personal question. You don't have to answer this if you don't want to. The first time you showed your scars to your husband, what was that like? Were you prepared for his reaction, good or bad? No, but not for the reason that you think. And I have a really great story to tell you. This I'll tell you about my husband's character and personality. And I just told this story the other day and I cried through the whole thing. So you'll have to forgive me if I get a little bit emotional. But the day after the surgery, I um, I had these drain bags in and and the two nurses who were in my room uh, were trying to um, instruct my husband on how to drain the bags. My husband had to drain my bags for me every five hours for 10 days. And 
So they gave him a lesson in draining the bags. And then one of the nurses wanted to get me into the shower. Um, She knew that she was going to have to also teach us how to clean around the drain bags because, of course, there was a lot of stitching around them. Plus, I had the stitches, I mean, just all across my chest. And, And so she went ahead and put me in the shower while the first nurse finished up with my husband. And then she sent him into the shower to get an an instruction in how to take care and clean around the drain bags. I was standing in the shower at the time with the first nurse and he walked in and, and um, saw me standing there in the shower and looked at me and said, Hey, gorgeous. And I mean, that that's just been his reaction from the very first moment. I mean, just, it just doesn't matter to him. Um, just the fact that I'm well and healthy to him, that that's, that's what matters. When you saw the scars for the first time, emotionally, where did that take you? To me, it was just so, the whole thing was so overwhelming. Um, I think the drain bags to me were the worst part. Having these tubes attached to these bags hanging out of my sides for 10 days. There was nothing fun about it. There there was just, yeah, we had moments where we laughed about this or that or the other. But um, for the most part, the whole thing was just numbing, mind numbing to me, overwhelming. And I couldn't think about it too much. I could, I looked at the scars. I looked at the, uh, all the, the, bags hanging out and everything and but I just couldn't really focus on it and think about it all that much and I I have to say Ange that a lot of it too for the first few days I was in a drug-induced haze (laughs) (laughs) which might have been a good thing at the time (laughs) I think for everybody it was a good thing (laughs) yay for drugs I want to let my (laughs) listeners know you can go to www.thingsinmyheadblog.com. You can see not only the time code for this particular broadcast. Also, we're going to show you some pictures of Gwenda. And uh, she's allowed us to put her beautiful face up on our website. And I just want you to know that this is the first time I've actually seen Gwenda since her hair has been growing back. And it's beautiful. I mean, it's it's growing back all nice and stylish and everything. And I have had a lot of people say that that they like it, but... You know, I've never worn my hair short. So to me, it's still very dramatic, even though now I do, now that it's warming up, I do go out most of the time now without any covering on my head. It's still when I look in the mirror and I, I it's it's very drastic to me and it's coming back uh, curly. You know, I've always had straight hair and it's coming back with a scary lot of gray in it, but it's hair. And so I'll take it. Well, you know, my husband actually shaved his head. I made the decision when I started losing my hair. And my oncologist was just spot on. She told me exactly when I would start losing my hair. And she was right. And it, it and when your hair comes out, it doesn't all fall out at once. It comes out in patches. And, and it hurts. I, I never knew that my head would be so sore where my hair would come out just literally in patches. I would brush it and, and it would, it was everywhere. It was in my shower and in my sink and on my furniture and in my carpet. And, and I couldn't stand it anymore. So I called my hairdresser and asked her if she would be willing to just go ahead and shave my head. To me, it was important to have that control. So many things about cancer, you have absolutely no control over. But this, I knew I could control. And so she came by my house one night after work and she um, she shaved my head. And when she shaved mine, she actually shaved my husband's and he went first. And so that was nice. We had a lot of laughs over that. And she gave me a pink polo cap. And um, she she's just awesome. But who looked better bald? You or him? Oh, yeah, him. Definitely. (laughs) Couldn't couldn't uh, convince daughter to shave to shave her head either. <laughs> oh no, <laughs> not gonna happen. <laughs> and I did not ask anybody else to do it. I didn't ask my husband to do it. Um, and he actually um, asked my kids if they were going to do it. One of the pictures on my fa- Facebook pages, um, 
my husband and my kids in their pink t-shirts, their support t-shirts. But um, I, I just told him, you know, I didn't want anybody to do it that didn't want to do it. And I didn't, I didn't ask anybody to do that. Unfortunately, we have to leave it there for this week. But next week, we are going to air the rest of this interview with Gwenda Kay, and she is going to get into the details of her treatment, what that meant and the emotions that she went through and the physical stress that it took on her body. Next week, she has an extremely important message for you, my listeners. So I do encourage you to listen in next Saturday. We will have the second part of this interview up. You can listen to us at www.thingsinmyheadblog.com. You can hear us on iTunes, on Stitcher, YouTube, and of course, on our iHeart affiliate, Spreaker Radio. So until next week, take care, everybody.